And uh, please give a warm welcome to Eloy San Felix and Andres Moreno for City of Services and Solutions. Hi, um, do you hear me? Everyone? It's too loud or it's okay? It's all right? Okay. Um, okay, so I'm Eloy. Here's Andres. Um, so we work at Riskier. Um, has people here heard of Riskier? Anyone? A couple? Okay, I'll just qu very quickly say. Um, so we do, um, well, we're an embedded security company. Um, we do security testing of embedded systems. Well, we started with smart cards back in like I don't know, 2001 or something, with a one-man show, right? And, uh, and we grew to about like 90 people now. Um, we moved from smart cards more towards like um, bigger systems like SOCs for pay TV mostly. Uh, but we also are involved with like mobile payment and, um, uh, you know, Android applications and stuff like that. So nowadays we cover a bit of uh, like the whole spectrum from just pure hardware attacks, not too much invasive, but more like uh, glitching and side channel stuff, uh, towards software uh, reversing and exploitation, white box crypto, and like a bit of everything. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about this uh, this RHME challenge that we ran um, a few months ago. Um, how many people have heard of it? Right, enough. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I will not say much about ourselves, but uh, before I go on, I'll go with, uh, well, credit where credit is due, right? So the whole team. We started this in 2015 with uh, basically two people doing the, the first edition of the challenge plus uh, somebody coordinating this. Um, then they got ideas of making it bigger, 2016, so they got a couple of uh, John Doe's here without picture. Um, and uh, yeah, so two interns, and uh, Andres is one of them as well, one of the uh, John Doe's. Um, and, uh, and some more people to make a few more challenges. We put a lot of effort into making a bootloader, uh, and they, they needed even more people. So in the end, we ended up with like quite a bunch of people uh, participating in this, some with more effort, some with less. Uh, so first of everything, thanks to all of these people. That's, that's why we're here, actually. Um, so what, did, what was this about? So this was um, an embedded hardware CTF. So it was a CTF, but not so much. Uh, the kind of CTF that you're used to, where you go to, like, you know, to Insomni Hack and you play for 10 hours. Uh, but we wanted to make something more um, really touching the hardware, right? So what we did is we put a lot of challenges from the usual exploitation, reversing kind of challenges, some crypto stuff, um, a little bit of black box stuff, um, and fault injection and side channel attacks on, those, on that Arduino. So we had like, uh, I think, 20 or so, many challenges, everything in the Arduino. Um, and this was how this was supposed to work. I don't think you can read it, but on the top here, um, we do have, basically you had to solve a challenge to pre-qualify. It was a very simple binary, like you could run S-trace or mem-trace or, or L-trace or something and just solve it. But this was more so that not everybody said, I want a free Arduino. Um, but we got many people saying we want a free Arduino. We had a cap of 500, so we had to ship actually 500 Arduinos. Um, then we sent the boards. And the boards would be personalized with a bootloader, a bootloader that we provided there with, uh, with some keys that would be used to authenticate and decrypt the challenges. So you could not load those challenges in other Arduinos, because that would be too easy in some cases. Uh, you could only load it in, with our Arduino. And, it, and that, was, uh, that was all based on that bootloader that we put quite some effort on. Now, you can imagine that, uh, you know, shipping 500 Arduinos and putting the little sticker over them and, you know, like putting them in these envelopes where, uh, um, yeah, this took, a <laughs> this took a little bit of time. Um, so we ended up starting a little bit after November 2016. Um, so we extended the deadline to the end of February to give people a chance to play, right? Because we, I mean, we shipped to the Netherlands and then it was like, you know, one day or two to ship because we, were, we are in the Netherlands. But we shipped to San Francisco and then it took like three weeks to get there. So yeah, this was not very nice to people, so that's something that we need to learn for next year. But anyway, we ended up extending the deadline. So once you got your board, you entered this panel. Um, and this was a map that uh, one of our colleagues draw. Um, so here is, um, it's kind of like the Monkey Island map. Yeah, uh, You have, uh, yeah, so, so each of these lands here are like territories with the different categories of challenges. So you can see like here, you have, for example, the, uh, um, the exploitation area. Here you had, uh, where are you? Here you had the reversing area. You had side channel analysis attacks. You had um, a bit of crypto. And you had up here reverse, uh, fault injection attacks. And then there were a few paths across them because that was like kind of giving hints of the relationship between challenges, uh, like which one you should do after which one and kind of stuff like that. Anyway, you see 
quite a few um, stops here. That's like, uh, I think, was it 22? 22 challenges, plus the bootloader territory here, which was like a special flag uh, without an official solution. But if you broke that, you got twice as many points as with any of the other challenges. Um, so I think everyone solved some, uh, like every challenge was solved except the bootloader. At least as far as we know. I don't know if there is anybody there that solved it. But So what we're going to do now, we're going to go through a few of these challenges. And uh, we did a selection. We started with some of the reverse engineering challenges, which are linked, um, which end up in, an, in a fold injection challenge. And then we'll move towards some more challenges that are more on the hardware side. And that's what Andres will be discussing. So the first one is this fridge JIT. G -I -J -I -T. Um, it's a lot of text. What matters here is that they tell us, first, there is a VM running on this thing. Um, and second, you need to crack a password compare routine. That's probably implemented inside that VM, right? Um, and we give you the dump of the firmware and the dump of the, uh, um, the data space on the Arduino. So it looks something like this. You get, an, in the AVR program memory, you get your program here, right? Which is a, a virtual machine interpreter. This virtual machine interpreter uses the AVR RAM to keep track of its own code and its own data. It fetches an instruction, it decodes it, it executes it, and it writes back to data memory for the registers, etc. So a way to solve this is obviously reverse engineer the, uh, um, the uh, VM interpreter, understand enough of how it works, make a disassembler, and then reverse engineer the logic of the password compare routine, which is stored right here. Yeah? That's the normal approach to do this. Um, if you started reversing, actually, you could find that there was some sort of debugger in the board. Uh, and this was actually the easiest way to go about on this challenge, was to enter this debugger. And you needed to reverse engineer your way to this. Um, if you press Control c enough times, you would end up here. Um, it was just in the main loop. You could see like there was a check for Control c um, And if you hit the right moment, then you end up here. And this is actually just a disassembler and a step-by-step -step execution for you. So you didn't need to do AVR reversing at this stage yet. Or, well, a little bit to figure out, you know, Control c is a special, a special thing and then go for it. Um, so this was actually pretty simple code. Once you had this, you could go just step through and go one by one and then read the, the disassembly. It was kind of broken in the sense that one or two instructions were not supported by the debugger. That was in purpose to force a bit of reverse engineering. Um, but it was fairly easy. And you ended up with, uh, oh, yeah. Well, you ended up with fairly easy password compares. There was another way, which was even easier, which is the next challenge actually had the same VM, but allowed you to load bytecode. So if you, and then to step into the debugger manually, just right away, without control C tricks, with anything. Uh, so you could actually just pull the, the bytecode from one dump, put it in the second challenge, and then reverse engineer it there with the bootloader. That was way easier, but, uh, but then you needed to figure out where the bytecode was in memory. So yeah, so after a bit of reversing, you end up with these uh, this few password compare routines that are something like what you see here. Um, so it's just very simple arithmetic, you know, rotate a few bits and XOR with something, and it has to be something else. So that gives you the password. Uh, just fairly standard reverse engineering of, um, of a password compare. Now, the second challenge was a bit more interesting. That's, uh, it's still the same VM, but this time we get told um, that the password is actually, the flag is actually somewhere in memory. So it's not anymore in the, in the bytecode itself, but you need to actually break out of the VM and read memory of the Arduino. So you need to, have to find a bug to do that. So, yeah, I try to not put too much uh, AVR assembly here, so that's why I just went to the code. Um, it's easier to see. Uh, you can see very, very clearly here that these few instructions, they're just uh, the bitwise and or XOR, all the logic, uh, the, the normal logic instructions, they didn't actually do any bound checking on the registers. So what you see up here is the R is the register that's encoded in the bytecode. And if you put a number that's higher than the number of registers in this virtual machine, then you get an out-of-bounds access. So how could you exploit this? Well. In this case, you actually need to reverse engineer enough to understand what the VM is like. Uh, this VM had eight general purpose registers, and then followed by in the same structure and packed together two bytes next to each other, because this is a 16-bit address space. So we had 16-bit registers from 0 to 7, then the 
um, actually these were no these were 32 bit registers actually so we had uh, 32 bit seven 32 bit registers uh, so zero eight 72 bit 32 bit registers damn it um, then followed by flags and data then data length which is the length of the data memory of the virtual machine and then code and code length which is the length of the payload so you can see here data and code are actually just pointers right so if you would smash with register nine, uh, well, eight, because we start counting at zero, right? With register eight, you would smash this guy. Now you can point it anywhere. And now you can use the load instruction in the VM to load memory from this new pointer, for any offset from this new pointer, as long as it's less than data len, right? But you can change it anytime you want. So you can say, I'm gonna set it to zero, then load from zero, into a register, and now you read the register. You also got an instruction to print the register through the serial port, so that makes it easier for you to get the data out of the VM. Um, so then you repeat this over and over again until you get the full program memory, uh, the full data memory. So this was my payload. It's just what I said. It's basically preparing, this was, well, my Python code preparing the payload with a Python assembler that I made for, for when I was testing this challenge for my colleague. Um, yeah, basically on the top, you see a bit of preparation. I set the register zero to some counter. Um, I set the register five to a step count. And this is because it's, it's no one byte, it's OX100, but that's because this is gonna be on top. Uh, so this is gonna be a 32-bit register that will go into the flags and the data pointer. I need to keep the flag zero so that it just thinks nothing happened. And I need to set the flags, uh, the data pointer one byte every time increment, incrementally, right? So I start with this. Um, I then use the uh, uh, XOR operation to clear a few registers. And uh, I use XOR of eight with four. Four contains my original address with uh, eight being overlapping with the data pointer. Then I can set up the data pointer. And then I just loop over. So I put the data out and I loop over. I dump, dump the whole flag, uh, the whole SRAM, and then I get the flag, right? Fairly simple. There is no much code execution yet, just reading memory. Um, right, so that was one challenge, or well, that was the second challenge. The, uh, the third challenge, which was called Weird Machine, it was like the same, an iteration of the same, but this time you were told um, that you cannot read it. Well, you were not told explicitly, but you would find out that you cannot read it with the same technique because the store, uh, the load and store opcode handlers, they were patched. So you couldn't read from the memory space where the flag was. We just put like a blacklist. This area is forbidden for, this, uh, for the VM, right? So now you really need to use this to get code execution to go around the VM handlers. So yeah, how do you do that? Well. It's AVR, right? Um, this, are people familiar with AVR enough? No? Some yes, some no. So AVR is a Harvard architecture. Um, it means that the data is not executable. Data space and program space are separate. I cannot just jump to my data. It's like non-executable data by default, by just by design, right? Uh, it's not like you don't need to do like page table magic or anything, it just, it just doesn't work. There is no way you can do it. So you really have to do ROP. Okay, you have to reuse the code that's already there to try to make whatever you want to make out of the device. Um, there is a standard way of doing ROP in most systems where you find a stack pivot, which will just make the stack pointer point to your own memory, and then you trigger that, and it will start a ROP chain by using like the tails of different functions, right? Um, this, this was a way to do this. Um, you could use the opcode handlers. They were a table of function pointers so that's a very juicy target usually for exploitation. You just go modify that, point it to your stack pivot, trigger that instruction with your bytecode, and then it starts executing your ROP chain. There was an easier way, and a more like, or easier, an AVR way. So it turns out AVR maps all the general purpose registers on the data memory. So if you write to a certain specific offset in memory, you're actually changing the stack pointer. So that's, that's really nice for making a stack pivot. It's a stack pivot by default, right? It's like you have a write, you have a stack pivot. So basically, you put your, your payload somewhere in memory, and then you write to this offset that I have in the slide, 5D, 5E, for this particular Arduino, that changes the stack pointer. So you write the address of your ROP chain into that stack pointer memory, uh, memory space, and then when the next function returns from the stack, your, stack, uh, your ROP chain has been triggered, okay? Um, so there, there was one thing, though. Um, I'm used to architectures like ARM and Intel, where the stack pointer points to the next data to be popped. In AVR, it points to the next, next lot to push into. So it's like off by one. 
I spent hours with this. I was like, why does this work? Why does this not work? Why is it failing? And in the end, it was like, huh. I dumped the stack, and I'm like, stuff seems off, off by one. I mean, what the hell? So I just subtracted one, and it worked. And then I went to the data sheets, and I understood why. Um, but yeah, it, it's sometimes these small differences, they just, yeah, they, they bite you, and you spend many hours with these things. Anyway, this, this was the challenge. This was the official solution. Uh, there was another flaw in the, uh, in the VM that we hadn't foreseen, but you know, good that uh, these guys over there, the Hyderabad guys and Balda found it. Um, basically, we were checking the bounds in the call instruction. We were in implementing something like the Intel call instruction. So you push the return address to the stack. We were checking bounds before the push and not after subtracting four. So we checked bounds bef at the beginning, then we subtracted four, and we pushed into there. What that means is that we can push into minus four, and then it's out of bounds. And then you get a one-time ride out of bounds with this. Um, one time every time you run the call up, like reset the VM and run the, the thing. Um, so this actually was easily exploitable because of two things. First, memory layout, and second, the fact that we had a, a loader or a debugger that allowed us to load code again. So in the first step of this, you would have to smash. So you use the underflow. You can see that the data, the VM data, is just after the uh, VM state. So it's just after the code pointer and the code length. So in the first step, you underflow the stack, and it allows you to smash these code, code and code len variables. So now we can point anywhere we like the code, right? Now, the second part was the debugger has an, an option to load new code, which would use this pointer to write the code into. So you got yourself a new arbitrary write, which means code execution in exactly the same way as I mentioned before. So this was the solution that some of the players took, um, which was slightly different than ours. Um, Wow, I went quite fast, I think. Yeah. Well, I still have one more. Um, so the next challenge was the same VM, but it would authenticate the bytecode. So it would be like a secure boot kind of thing. Um, the idea was, by looking at you know, what's up there, which it says fault injection, and looking at this reminder that tells people, keep in mind that with fault injection, you might damage your board. The idea was that you would glitch the, uh, the comparison. So, this looked a bit like this. It was, um, so there was bytecode and 16 bytes of MAC, a message authentication code. This was all in the encrypted bootloader and in the encrypted challenge you got, so you couldn't really reverse engineer the key of the MAC, right? Um, so it went into a MAC, an OMAC with some keys. It checked if they were the same with the memory, um, like with a time, time constant compare so that you couldn't do, couldn't do timing attacks or at least we think it's time constant, we didn't check, but we checked at the code level, but we didn't time it. I don't know if anybody timed from the, from the players. Um, and if it's equal, it boots the, the bytecode. If it's not equal, it just says no, no, right? We, it's kind of, it, it's the standard secure boot that you get in all, in all mobile phones nowadays or stuff like that. Only instead of using RSA signatures, which is what the majority of systems do, we're running on an Arduino, we cannot do RSA in there because it's just terribly slow and it takes more space than we actually have for, for actually writing the code. Uh, so we did a Mac. So you could glitch there and then you would get, that was the standard, the original solution. Um, turns out, well, there was an alternative solution which was instead of glitching there, you glitched during execution. It turns out that our virtual machine had a, it had a check when there was an invalid opcode, it would drop into the debugger, yeah? So what you do is you just load valid code. We gave you, uh, like, as an input, we gave you an, a valid authenticated code. So you load that one with the good Mac, it puts it in, and now during execution, you glitch it. It will decode incorrectly, it will think it's an invalid instruction, and it will say, oh, okay, let's go to the debugger. And now, because you're in the debugger, you can load your arbitrary code, and then do the whole exploitation that we did in the previous challenge again. So yeah, that, that was not fully foreseen by the developer of the challenge, but it was actually obvious after the fact, but anyway. There was yet another um, surprising solution by, I think by only Hyderabad, but I'm not sure if other people did it. Um, they actually started, you know, they, they treat this as a black box. They started tinkering with the, with the data. They saw at the end of the bytecode, there were a bunch of knobs. They thought maybe they are not authenticating the, the extra padding, but it will get executed. Uh, so they started changing it, and they realized, oh, it, it still boots, even though we changed some data at the end. Um, so yeah, we apparently made a mistake there, and that allows them to, to run arbitrary code. <laughs> um, actually, 
we thought, how is that possible? I mean, we're, we're for sure running the Mac over the padding and everything. That was in the code, right? So when I was preparing this presentation, I went to look at the code and like, what, what the hell happened here? So it turns out this Mac function we were using, which we took from a library, has a message length up here in bits. You can imagine what comes next. Where we call it, we were passing bytes instead. So yeah, this, this was kind of a big fail. <laughs> So it was not the padding, it was just the fact that we were authenticating only one eighth of the message, right? <laughs> yeah, but shit happens. <laughs> um, yeah, so these were the, the first few challenges that were related and we thought were interesting to share. Um, now, do we want to do, do, does anybody have questions about these challenges maybe? Or we move on to the other ones? Yes. Yeah. You could do any of them. Both of them work on the Arduino, no problem. Um, you could also do EM glitch or whatever you want, but you know it's overkill. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, it, you just drop the voltage a bit and it will, yeah. Yes? No, but I mean, I think it, it's a, it's an AVR 80 mega 328. I mean, this is not a secure microcontroller. I mean, they, they are not protecting against glitching at all. That's, uh, I mean, the, the bootloader survives, so you can do something on top of it, I mean, it seems, but, you know, it's an Arduino, and anybody who has reversed an, an Arduino chip can probably know where to glitch to just disable everything and then get access to the whole thing, so, anyway, uh, no. No, but, yeah, no, it's no feedback, yeah. Anybody else, or we move on? Okay, thanks, then over to you. You want this? Hello? Okay. Uh, I'm going to show an um, uh, emergency transmitter that was uh, the hardest uh, challenge we had. It uh, mixed a couple of uh, skills. So it was like 500 points just below the bootloader. Um, the idea was really simple. You downloaded the, the binary and uh, you flash it on the board. And when you flash it, you get uh, uh, this message telling you to insert 16 bytes, and the bytes were going to be transmitted encrypted, and that was it. So the, we actually had to add this node at the end because I think people started glitching and they did not know that they had to extract the key. So they were just submitting bytes at random. So if you find the key, you should be able to encrypt the input and check against the output that you actually got the flag. Uh, so how it goes? Uh, you write 16 characters. The, the Arduino let blinks, and that was it. And that was the, the whole thing. So yeah, the first step was to connect the, the rival, the oscilloscope, and try to see what was going on with the LED. Uh, you will find out that it was Morse code, and yeah, you don't have a uh, decoder for Morse code either in Rigel or whatever, so you have to write your own stuff. And uh, here is a setup from uh, Zeta2. He, he was trying to decode the Morse code and try to see what the transmission was. Uh, he was using uh, here uh, a Raspberry Pi, I guess. And well, that's not a very good idea. You want to do something with a real-time processor that, such that you know that you're measuring every time the same uh, pace. OK. Is OK? Oh, yeah. Uh, OK, so the first step uh, or the first stage of the challenge was actually trying to get the uh, output out of the, of the board. And uh, yeah, start from there and uh, trying to, to get something out. Uh, so. After the after getting output, well, the the next thing was, yeah, I tried to find a buffer overflow, uh, abusing the the transmitter, trying to send more data, well, whatever you tried, and if you, yeah, tried enough times, you will see that the transmitter will start behaving weird under certain circumstances, but it was not supposed to because you should uh, be able to test the key if you get it out. So something funny was happening. If you send enough data, uh, your, uh, your data will start appearing actually on the output. So you, will ca you can see here that the uh, beef appears in the output. So you were able to write uh, into the output buffer 
and you were also able to corrupt the um, the encryption process. But it was not the case every single time. If you just send uh, a little uh, a little couple bytes after the enter, the enter the new line will just trigger the encryption process. Then nothing will happen. You will get the same uh, the same output. So. Uh, why is this happening? Well, the book of feature one is that uh, the input is uh, being handled by a uh, interruption. It's not being pulled. So yeah, we did not disable the interruption. And you can see that uh, it checks for the new line here. And uh, actually, it checks for the buffer line here. But if, if you send a new line, the position will reset, and you will be able to override the buffer. And that way you can see uh, uh, corruption in the encryption. And the second bug or feature uh, was that the, the input buffer was uh, being used as an output. So Hyderabad has a good test to actually uh, explain this. You can in, uh, press uh, enter twice, you will get two outputs. Uh, and if you encrypt the first output uh, again, you will get the, the second output. So uh, you will see that this value will remain, the, the output of the first operation will remain in the input for the, for the second one. So uh, you have uh, uh, two box now. That is uh, the input buffer is being reused uh, for the internal state for the crypto operation and that you can actually corrupt the, the, the data that is on that buffer. So, the first idea you have when you have you, when you can corrupt the the encryption process is doing uh, DFA, yeah, differential fault analysis. So yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. But uh, you really don't need to do DFA here. You can simplify the attack, and you can just go after the the last outrun key, right? Because the normal DFA you don't have uh, control over the value or over the position where you are injecting the fault. So you try to inject before that, and then you do the math from here. But because we, we know where we are uh, actually corrupting uh, after the, the new line, we control the position, and we control the value of the, of the corruption. So we can simplify the math, and uh, just injecting zeros in, uh, just before the outrun key, we can obtain the last AES uh, sub, uh, last run key, and from there, we can reverse the key scheduling and obtain the, the value uh, of the key. So that was uh, the official solution was uh, attacking the outrun key. And everything was about time. Does it work? So uh, basically, I wanted to say um, the, out, the outrun key, for those that don't know AES, that's simply an XOR, right? So if you manage to put zeros at the input of the XOR, you get the key out. So that, that's the, but the, 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 round the key. last round key but then you have enough information to wind back to the beginning of the AES and, and get the, the actual key. It's, it's the same as attacking a white box. You try to inject a corruption in the memory and try to get the, uh, to attack it here so you can get the wrong key out. Uh, but the, the, the issue here is the timing. Yeah, you, you need to uh, send the extra data just uh, before you do the SOAR. So you can uh, actually, yeah, uh, get the key out. But the, Doing that at random will not be very successful. So you can uh, know where to inject the fault because if you inject it uh, too soon, nothing will happen. If you if you inject uh, uh, here a zero too soon, then it's like the input never changed. So you will get the very same output, and this means that uh, you just uh, your delay is too short. If you do it too late, then it will appear on your output. So you can actually script the whole process. And uh, if you just get one single output, uh, one single byte in the output corrupted, then that's a, a result you can use to get the, the key out. So how the exploitation works, you just uh, connect uh, an Arduino with two UART ports, one to the computer, one to the, to the target, and then you start injecting stuff. And with the colors and yeah with a filter you you can you can try enough time until you get the 16 bytes out the problem is that the, there's so many bytes that you can 
at before the outrun key ends. So it was not possible to send 16 bytes to get the last byte before the uh, before the sort ended. So you have to actually play it smart, send some bytes, delay, and then send some more bytes to, to be able to get the, the last one. And the delay between bytes is also kind of important. So this challenge was all about timing, and that's why like using another Arduino was important. Uh, the, the, that was the official solution. You just uh, do this with the script, you get the, the, the last run key, and yeah, you use the, the normal scripts on the internet, git, whatever, and get the key out. You just revert the, the key scheduling. And the different approaches we saw was uh, Idrabos tried to, to do this attack. It seems that it didn't work, I don't know why. So they, were for no, they tried the normal DFA attack, and they only had to inject four successful faults on the algorithm, and they got the key out. Balda, uh, he missed, I think, two bytes at the end, and he had to brute force those two. I think that's a timing issue. Uh, we did normal DFA and failed. I did normal DFA and failed. I was unable to get the patterns out, uh, and I attacked the last round, so yeah. And we were expecting someone to use the actually fall injection setup from previous uh, challenges to attack this one, because uh, this one has a little bit of uh, anti-fold attacks countermeasure, but uh, it, it was possible to actually get the key out with this way, and even with SS, uh, side channel analysis. Uh, I want to show also um, one side channel analysis uh, challenge. I'm going to show the second one. I will explain later why not the first, why not the third one. So. Uh, the SA2 was, the, the second challenge was uh, the same as the first one. You just uh, send uh, 16 bytes in. Some uh, encryption process get uh, done in the um, board, and you get the output. And that was it. We didn't add any command line or anything, so it was uh, actually pretty easy to script the thing, and you don't have to write drivers or whatever. And the, the second challenge was just the same as the first one plus countermeasures. So you could solve the, the first uh, challenge with the Chip Whisperer and just following the tutorials uh, that uh, Colin has in the wiki. Uh, but the second one was a little bit more tricky. And I'm going to show how to do it with the Chip Whisperer, because uh, as far as I know, nobody did the second one with the Chip Whisperer. I think Hydra used uh, custom tools for, for that one. And well, I, I'm not going to use uh, the risk tool because it's too easy. Or, well, I think I have time, so probably I do some small demo. Uh, and, well, you can, we didn't say that uh, the algorithm was AES-128, but if you hook the scope and you count rounds, yeah, you can uh, actually uh, find out that it was AES-128. So the setup is the normal uh, SCA setup, the chip whisperer, this is uh, live overflow. A Rigel chip whisperer, um, yeah, logic level converter because the voltages were different. A chunk resistor removing the capacitors. Yeah, that's uh, the normal uh, trace acquisition. And this is Hyderabad that they went the extra mile to get rid of the noise and all the stuff. So they made their own board to get the traces and they use a picoscope with the uh, immense amount of memory. Yeah, they went pro on this one. Um, once the acquisition was done, uh, you can see that uh, there's not a lot to see. There's uh, this trace, well, it looks uh, yeah, full of uh, noise and you cannot really distinguish anything. You can do a low pass filter and realize that everything is heavily misaligned. So there's some patterns there. You can see here uh, some spikes. And in this part, and you can see also here at this uh, part that something is happening. So you, ch you need to solve the, the misalignment first. Uh, the attack path, the, you can uh, try to get uh, the um, steps from the Chip Whisperer tutorials, align the, align the traces to the place you want to attack. So if you want to, uh, see, you can make an educated guess where the Xbox is, and then try to attack that, or yeah and then uh, attack the Xbox, and it will fail. The thing is that um, 
the chip whisperer only holds 24K points. So the memory is very limited. And the guy that designed the, the challenge were like a little bit heavy on the delays. So the S-Box was not captured, was actually out of the picture. And if you try to, to do the acquisition later, the delays were so heavy that you will have uh, traces with uh, still the Xbox out or others with the Xbox like previous uh, in the previous window. And as far as I know, the chip whisper cannot drop traces that are not aligned. So usually what we do at the company, we align the traces that do not align, we drop them because we know that the, we cannot get anything useful out of them. And then we solve with the one that align and that we know that have useful information. But as far as I know, the Chief Whisperer cannot do it. So the solution was not to attack the S-Box, as uh, shown in the tutorials and all the documentation, but to actually attack the, um, the first uh, key whitening, the, the, fir the first sore in the, in the first round. So it's not as good as attacking the S-Box, but uh, you will get at least some key candidates. So now the new plan of attack is uh, aligning where, where the XOR is happening and attacking the outround key. So you can see here one trace. Uh, and you can see at, at this point where the, this is the outround key. These are delays. I will show later the uh, like better graphic. With the, you can actually differentiate the delays. And here are actually the, all the traces uh, that were aligned. And you can see that the very same spikes are like in very in all the traces. So we know that this is happening in all the traces, and now you can attack this uh, key addition. If you zoom in and you get something like this, you know that uh, you got something useful. You can see there the the power change with each of the traces, and all the traces are aligned. So you can perform the attack there, and you will get something like this. So. Uh, these, these traces and these results are actually uh, Hydrabus uh, test, and the key is their key. I, uh, they provided me with the, with the traces. And uh, you can see that, for example, here in, in, in these uh, bytes, the key candidates are uh, more or less, uh, uh, has a high confidence. You can more or less guess that is one of those. Same here, same here. But you're gonna have a problem in the 12 byte, and probably also in the fifth one. That is not the 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 um, probability of those bytes is not that uh, different from the previous one. So you will have uh, to brute force the key. You have some keys that some bytes that have more or less the same Hemiweight, and here you will have some more, and you will end up with something like this. This is how I did it. Basically. So I just by I selected uh, the bytes that I thought were worthwhile in the brute forcing, and I just did Python. So basically, what you get out of the DPA attack is a list of scores for each potential key, um, and uh, what you could see in the previous picture, which is not very visible from far, is that the top two candidates for almost every key were quite apart from the next, but from whatever is afterwards. So that gives you confidence that one of those two has to be the right key, and you need to combine them. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, uh, once you have the, the, the byte, the candidates, you can just uh, create a script uh, and brute force it. You have the input, the output, and just go all over them, and you will be able to extract the keys. And that's it, that's uh, the second SCA. Uh, what was the difference between the side channel analysis challenges? Well, the first one was more or less uh, uh, challenge to get your chip whisperer uh, calibrated or whatever. So it was uh, in plain and simple encryption. There were not countermeasures. And we even provided the signal to do the triggering. So you can just hook on the LED, and you will be able to trigger exactly where the encryption starts. The second SCA uh, had uh, random delays, and we removed the trigger. So you now had to trigger on the um, UART line and try to capture there, uh, from there. But yeah, as we saw, you will, the Xbox will move and out of the capture window. 
And SC3, the, the last uh, side channel analysis was a little bit more heavy. There was no trigger. Uh, the very same random delays from uh, the previous challenge were present, but we added dummy rounds and anti-DFA. So, for example, uh, one of the teams solved uh, uh, side channel one and two, but not the three, and they solved the, the, those two very fast in conjunction with the fall injection one, so we suspect they did the first two with fall injection, with DFA. And the third, because it has anti-DFA, uh, yeah, it was not possible. And now, uh, another oops moment. Uh, we added the countermeasures on uh, side channel three uh, after the first uh, add round key. So all the dummy rounds and stuff were after the first uh, SOAR operation. So you can still attack the first SOAR operation and get the key out. So it didn't matter. You can attack all of them the same way, and that was it. So, yeah, we screw up there. Um, well, uh, let's uh, do some highlights. We have uh, several people doing a lot of interesting stuff during the challenge. This is uh, Aris. He made a logic circuit to solve uh, one challenge. So this challenge was called walk a mole It's like the game. You just have to walk the moles, and you will get signals on the pins. You have a couple uh, digital pins and stuff, and you needed to in interpret that and send the signal at the right time and try to get the, the mole, right? It was more, more of a game, not the exploitation thing. And he found that, and he designed a completely uh, digital circuit. No keyword, no nothing and it will solve the, the challenge uh, by its own. So, yeah, this was... So not only no keyboard, no nothing, there is no code running there. It's just pure logic. That's the... Exactly. This very good. Uh, we have the, this guy that maybe you know him. He's, he, he managed to do at least one side channel analysis without uh, having previous experience. Uh, yeah, quite the challenge. And he's doing uh, uh, the write-ups on, on video, so you can go and search him up. Uh, Hydrabus, they made this custom board to reduce the noise. So when, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's beyond duty. What we did, when, when we were doing the challenges, we tested everything because we didn't want to release something that was not possible to be solved and that was not possible to be solved with the tools that people had at home. So if you could solve it with risk tools, yeah, good luck. So we tested this, and when we tested, we removed everything of the board, except the processor, like the, the UR chip, the LDO, everything. We removed everything, and of course we got really nice traces, and we solved it like right away. And we thought, okay, this is easy. But it turns out that uh, when you have only one board, and you're trying to play the CTF, well, you are a little bit more uh, concerned about removing stuff and messing up with it. So the traces were not that good, and the solution they came up with was designing uh, a custom board to reduce the noise and actually get the traces. So the traces uh, that you see before that I used were acquired with this board as far as I know, I guess. So yeah, this is crazy. and. They also, I think, they sent a patch upstream to Sim ABR because uh, the UART was not implemented properly. Yeah, so a lot of work. And they also received the award one month late than win. So amazing work. Mr. Macete, this guy made um, Radare the compiler for the virtual machine that we did. So. <laughs> Yeah, he just, I think he just wanted to show that Radare can do everything. So he got graphs, he got, yeah, he got everything running on it. So it's amazing work. And he has also really good write-ups on, on the challenges that uh, Eloy explained. Uh, the winners, uh, Hydra Boss, first, they solved everything except the bootloader. They have like four days trying to, to beat the bootloader. Uh, thanks to God, it was not possible. It was not designed to be uh, broken, so it's good. Uh, guys, uh, Valda 
uh, captured the swag and sourced one. For, from these guys, uh, they, the Balda and guys missed like only two challenges, and they solved at least one of each category. So if, if you pay attention, you will see that there's a lot of skills involved in all the categories we had, and they managed to beat at least one of each one. So this is amazing, and they also played alone. So yes, it's, uh, it's, it's quite the fit. So really good work. We still have one winner to announce, and is the, the best write-up that is uh, currently being voted, selected. Uh, yeah, so on Risk Your Twitter, you can go, you can find the, the, um, the write-ups, and you can find where to vote uh, for the best write-up. Hello. So yeah, so, so these were a few of the highlights of the challenges and the CDF. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we did this to try to get people to learn embedded systems and, uh, and try to do some of these attacks that people don't really do on their normal CTFs. Um, we had fewer players than boards we, we delivered. And you know, it's like 80, 80 out of the 500 went to Spain. Um, in Spain, if you say free, then people just jump. Uh, <laughs> I think in the Netherlands also they say, but anyway. Um, but yeah, in the end, we had, we had a few players with high level of skills and, uh, and with quite good motivation. Um, it's interesting that uh, this ran for like three months or so, and some people kept doing it like every evening for three months. I would probably give up earlier, but you know, great work for those. Um, yeah, the team had fun preparing the CTF. We had a few screw ups, as you've seen, um, but you know, there is always something to learn. Uh, we also, yeah, we, next year we'll try to prepare earlier and, you know, like learn from this, um, send, the, send the boards earlier and that kind of stuff. Because it really takes time, not only to, I mean, have you ever tried to order 500 Arduinos from China? Fake Arduinos, right? But still. I mean, you cannot order 500. People have like 100 and the other one has 50 and then, you know, somebody tells you, yeah, I'm going to ship them and they don't ship them, they don't come. Anyway, we, we'll try to get all these boards way earlier and, and try to be, and like, have everybody have the boards at the time the CTF starts, because that was also not, that was a bit unfortunate. Um, and for the challenges, it seems that people had fun with it, so that's good. But we also had some sort of complaints that there was a bit of guessing involved in some cases, and uh, yeah, that we will try to get rid of as well. Um, I mean, in the end, one of the things is for side channel attacks and fault injection, you often really have to guess. I mean, if you're doing a bootloader which is encrypted that you don't have the ROM and you just want to glitch it, there is no other way than just hook up an oscilloscope, measure the traces, try to, f try to figure out what happens and try to glitch it. Or you go the extra mile of getting like a, a SEM, a scanning electron microscope and just try to get the bootloader out, right? But that's a little bit of a different level of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of price range for one to the other. Um, right, so there will be another one next year. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we'll, we'll have updates on, on the Riskier Twitter. Um, it will be around November. It will probably be similar in the sense that it will probably be an Arduino or a similar board um, that will deliver for free to people. Most likely will also allow people to, to actually buy extra boards if they want. Because, I mean, we had to put a cap, right? Because you're paying these boards. Uh, but then if you're glitching them you, and you kill your board at day one, then you're done. So some people said, well, I would pay for it. I would gladly pay for it if you give me the option. So we just probably give the option. You'll, you'll say, like, I want three more boards, and you pay the cost of the boards, and that's it. Um, and yeah, you can also follow for other stuff. Um, we're putting everything on GitHub. So I said in the beginning there was a bootloader, which was uh, encrypt, like decrypting and authentication, authenticating challenges. We have removed that from the challenges now. So we're releasing the challenges without the bootloader. Uh, so you can load them on any stock Arduino if you want to play with this. Um, if you want to learn, like, you know, side channel attacks with the Chip Whisperer, or if you want to make your own setup for glitching or any of that. Um, and all the solutions from, uh, from all the players are already out there. Um, I think we plan also to make our own solutions in some cases where we, can, where, where we think we can provide some additional information. Um, yeah, and everything will be linked from the GitHub and from Twitter. Um, yeah, so, so that's it, I think. Um, well, so that, that's our, um, yeah, our emails and our contacts. Um, as you see there, we're hiring all the time. So if you're interested, and if you like this kind of stuff, just get in touch. Um, and if you have any questions, please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, no questions. OK, thanks. Thank you.